Hello, everyone. For those of you just joining us, welcome to the Radical Exchange Annual Conference. Our next session is Migration Leads to Innovation. I'll turn it over to our moderator, Natalia, to introduce herself, the panelists, and begin the session. Hi, everyone. It's so great to have all of, I mean, so many folks from, from every part of the world. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about Migration and, uh, you know, as a daughter of uh, immigrants and so on, uh, it's been a tremendous uh, conversation I've had with our panelists and, and all the work that they have been able to do uh, to be able to build the case for how important it is for us to be welcoming, uh, for us to like figure out the best uh, processes to open up, to be able to have a, a conversation, an honest conversation. Uh, because our societies are stuck in humanitarian and securitarian narratives of uh, the migrations. Uh, we see it in Europe. Uh, we're, we're seeing it in, you know, in the U.S. We're seeing it across the board. And um, even though there's one major threat, which relies really on the depletion of the social cohesion, an obvious symptom of, of this is job security for locals and newcomers. Um, but what if we could actually unite locals with newcomers, right? That's, a, that's an essential question. Um, simple fact-checking and advocacy doesn't seem to counteract the political polarization, neither fosters impactful uh, policies. So uh, I'm excited to have Alice Barbie uh, and Matthias Dufour who have successfully uh, contributed to the future of our society, especially in this realm. Um, their respective bottom-up initiatives uh, their design, their meaningful alliances to unleash an untapped uh, power of innovation is key. They're going to be highlighting uh, how reviving universal, universal concepts uh, consistency, uh, cons consistently lead to inclusive and resilient economies oh. and offer a demographic, a, a, a democratic uh, project in the context of global crisis, uh, like the pandemic we've been going through, right? Um, it's amazing how borders are really just erased when we're all talking about uh, virtual connections. And, and, and I just want to highlight that uh, we, our, our um, audience uh, comes, you know, we have uh, people watching from 60 different countries. Uh, oh. So imagine that. Uh, so that, that's tremendous. And, and more than a thousand people have signed up and are participating uh, in our live. Uh, so I couldn't be more excited about this. Um, so let me start our, um, our panelists. Uh, I'll give a little bit of background and then they're gonna present and then we're gonna open it up for questions. Uh, so I'm so thrilled to have Alice Barbie, uh, who is the co-founder and global CEO of Singa, a global movement connecting migrants, uh, migrants and uh, host societies and supporting migration led entrepreneurship. So Singa exists in 10 countries involving uh, 50,000 members. Uh, and running eight incubators, uh, supporting 200 entrepreneurs each year. Uh, and on that note, I just want to tell people that, you know, 20% of our biggest companies uh, in the U.S. Uh, have been started by, Im by immigrants. So, you know, how important is that uh, to feed into our economy? Uh, Singa today is an award-winning uh, organization, uh, having received many distinction awards, such as uh, Shoka Fellowship, Forbes 30 Under 30, Social uh, uh, award, uh, the Global Pluralism Award by the Aga Khan Network, the Medal of Honor of the City of Paris, uh, the in Intercultural Award of the, the UNAOC, the German Integration Prize. And in 2018, Alice was part of the first cohort of the Obama Foundation Scholar Program at Columbia University. Uh, why is that special to me? Because I used to work for Obama and um, we tried to do so much in order for us to open up and be able to be as welcoming as possible. Um, she graduated in law and political science at the University of Montpellier in Siena. Uh, and before all of this, uh, Alice was working as a CSR consultant uh, and was collaborating with the United Nations uh, Save the Children uh, in the Central School of Paris. Uh, she has co-founded other nonprofits related to civic engagement um, and, you know, she's led, her work has led uh, to be able to work with the Dalai Lama in 2018. Uh, so just an amazing, uh, amazing lady. We're so ha happy to have her. And I remember when I met the Dalai Lama almost 20 years ago. So that's exciting. Um, now, and then our second panelist um, will be Matthias Dufour. 
uh, he is the founder and chairman much, of much less, much less impressive CV, so <laughs> it's going to be faster. <laughs> Everyone, everyone, everyone is important in every single capacity and way. And so uh, he's the founder and chairman of Le Plus Important, uh, the most important. Uh, Le Plus Important is an innovative and independent think tank and action lab. Because here it's about taking action. It's not about just talking. It's action. Yes. We're always yes, about yes, action-oriented yes. policies. We put into action a committed... Uh, a committed community of experts and professionals of all ages and backgrounds to empower people and promote a more inclusive society. We promote the development of the capacities and skills of the middle class and how skilled uh, workers uh, meet the social changes of the digital economy. Our think tank inspires and shares uh, concrete solutions with public and private decision makers and their action lab uh, advises and boosts pro bono the work uh, and growth, uh, growth players of the social and solidarity economy. Uh, so, Matthias, we're so excited to have you as well. This is going to be a very Thank dynamic you. conversation. Uh, so, I'll you know open it up and please, uh, Alice, if you could tell us a little bit more uh, beyond everything I said, <laughs> uh, and the the stage is yours. Thank you, Natalia. It was a very nice presentation. I wasn't expecting it, uh, that my bio would be fully read. Uh, I'm thrilled to be here today and I, I have a, I feel a huge admiration for Radical Change um, Conference and all the people that are behind the scene right now. I'm discovering a whole new world and it's cheering. Um, uh, to, to come to the topic, well, I co-founded Singa in 2012. I was uh, 25 years old at the time and my journey has led me to work in different countries, work with international organizations such as the United Nations. And the feeling I had at this time with my co-founders is that, well, as you mentioned, uh, when it comes to migration, it's always about either securitarian or humanitarian, given the fact that the whole perception and the whole narrative about migrants, refugees, asylum seekers, all these names will bring some negative attitudes because it will bring negative images if you very simple exercise if you go and google and you type refugee or migrants um, you will find a bunch of pictures um, picturing people who are crowds traveling in extreme poverty or extreme conditions um, sometimes you would even see violence because you would see camps and people like tearing the walls and breaking stuff and on the other hand, when you when you write expat, for instance, on Google, you will see a bunch of blonde people with ch children at the beach. So my question is like, how comes that this existing narrative completely deletes um, what people who have a migrant or refugee background can bring to host societies? And to me, that's the core problem because we could talk about during hours about what people need because it's a reality. People who are refugees and migrants need things, they, they need shelters, they, they need uh, sufficient income, they need dignity. But it's also about what they're bringing. And I usually make a big difference between what's called integration and what's called inclusion. To me, integration is about um, picturing people based on their needs. For an example, you can say Yassine is a Sudanese refugee um, who just arrived in Paris and wants to learn French and is looking for a job. On the other hand, if you present Yassine as this newcomer who just arrived in Paris and speaks Arabic, um, English, and German, and is a tech developer, plus uh, used to be a doctor in his, in his home country, that shows you a whole different narrative. And to me, the whole question is about inclusion. So the work that we do with Singa, um, beyond supporting entrepreneurs with a migrant or refugee background, is also to, to, to mobilize communities because the way people see migration, the way whole societies see migration through the lenses of uh, politicians or the media is definitely not enough. There's a, this need to experience what it is to meet with someone, may it be a, may it be a refugee or asylum seeker, but for who he, he is and what he wants to do. The first question we ask at, we ask at Singa is what's your biggest dream? Um, we ask that to newcomers, like what do you want to do? 
and you'll be surprised with all the answers that you get. Like, I want to be a rap singer. Uh, I, I want to to be a doctor. I want to I, I want to sing. I want to dance. Uh, I want to be a pop star. I want to teach yoga. And to like, it, it's it's really good to 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 support people with the dreams and the ambitions that they have. But on the other hand, the the narrative shift needs to happen at a, at an individual level, because we know that in host countries, especially in Europe or or North America, you don't actually get to meet as a local, you don't actually get to meet with newcomers. You see them on TV, or maybe you're going to help them if you're in charity, if you're volunteering in a charity, but you will never get the chance to meet them at a peer to peer level where real meaningful interaction is possible. So this is what we um, trigger by doing community organizing where people are really peer to peer and connect and engage in a very meaningful way, because we know that the more refugee or migrants you know as a local, uh, the less racist you would be, as simple as that. We have data showing that uh, the narrative, the words that you're gonna use, uh, if, you, if you don't interact with a newcomer, uh, would essentially be like, oh, poor him or her, uh, she or he is a victim, or you say, there are threats to my country. But when you engage at a very personal level, you will talk about your friend, your co-founder, your business partner, your colleague, uh, your yoga teacher, et cetera, et cetera. And then the whole narrative will change. On the other hand, the more locals you know as a refugee or a migrant, well, the, the more happy, the happier you are. Um, because we have data also on our community showing that it takes 10 friends for a newcomer, including seven locals, to boost access to employment, housing, uh, speaking the language of the host country, uh, get married, have babies. We also have single babies in the community and people actually engage, become friends and sometimes get married and have kids. So that's to me, to just to, to kick off the conversation, I, I, I guess when it comes to narrative, it, it's all about experience and also storytelling when you when you show people um on their when you show the potential of people and not what they're lacking or what they're missing that tells an entirely different story so. and it's that storytelling right that that really makes a difference it, it humanizes uh the, you know our visitors and people coming in uh, I remember when my mother, uh, she moved to the U.S., uh, my mother is very dark, very, very, very dark. My father is Norwegian-American, and, um, you know, my mom's a lawyer uh, with a master's degree, and she and people thought that she was the nanny of her white kids, and that is just, you know, it just blows my mind to this day, uh, and so she's like, you know what, we're going to, you know, have to make a point of this, and, you know, they, they, they worked uh, to convince people that this is a, a beautiful love story. And uh, they're still together today, and they still do a lot of this work. It it scares me sometimes because they're knocking on people's doors in Texas, um, you know, uh, telling people to go and vote. <laughs> Just like they're like, oh. <laughs> so, uh, but thank you again. I appreciate that. We'll open up for more questions. Um, great, Matias. Yes. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Natalia, for your introduction. I am really, really thrilled to be here with you uh, at this uh, fantastic event and to share our views on uh, migration and, and innovation. So, um, as you said, I am I am leading uh, Le Plus Important, hashtag the most important, which is an innovative and independent think tank and action lab. Why uh, the most important? This sounds quite immodest, uh, but in reality, it has nothing to do with us. Um, but rather with the cause we are standing for as we want to fight the great fragmentation, the, the, the bipolar evolution of developed countries between globalized elites uh, uh, on the one hand and the rest of society on the other, which is struggling to keep a place, uh, to keep a pace. And since we believe that it's the very fabric of society or social cohesion, which is at stake, uh, potentially even democracy, which is at stake, we named our movement the most important. And so our, our core belief is that to fight this challenge of growing inequalities of opportunities, uh, we have a great lever, which is human capital development or an, an empowerment. Um, and, uh, and so what we do is to promote the development of capabilities and skills of the middle classes and, and low skilled workers to meet the social challenges of the digital economy and promote people employability. 
Um, so the topics we deal with are typically linked to how to make the job market and workplace more inclusive, how to help workers meet the challenges of the digital economy, not notably through reskilling, uh, how to help kids succeed at school, uh, disadvantage uh, youth su successfully enter the job market, or unskilled workers get reskilled or upskilled to get back to work. So we started in France, but uh, are now expanding overseas. Um, and, and so you may ask what's the relationship between this and, and the topic of our panel? Well, in your intro, you mentioned the need for a narrative shift from the humanitarian and securitarian narratives to, of the migrations. And, and this is exactly our point. The, the current political narrative in developed countries is being shaped by populists on an us versus them basis, with them being mostly migrants, but more broadly, all of those who support them. And so we want to replace that narrative, which is not only at, at odds with uh, enlightenment values, uh, but which is also putting people against each other and thus, and thus threatening the cohesion of, of our societies by another narrative based on the idea that our future lies not in the protection of one kind of population versus the other, but in the um, uh, empowerment of, of everyone. Let's uh, pull everyone upward. And let me explain a bit. So we believe that the populist uh, momentum is mainly fueled by two drivers, uh, cultural insecurity and economic insecurity. And uh, well, after the election of Trump, for instance, the debate was hot whether it was mostly for cultural or for economic reasons that he had been elected. And the, the answer is obviously both. Uh, but our belief is that cultural insecurity uh, wouldn't be as salient had economic insecurity not reached uh, so high levels. <clears throat> and so in in economic insecurity is the fact, the lack of trust, not only from the lower, but also from the middle classes in the idea that, okay, today might not be great, but tomorrow will be better. And if people don't trust in this promise anymore, then we, we are in trouble. Uh, and our belief is that cultural insecurity is hard to tackle. Uh, I'm not sure bringing more facts or more reasoning will change things dramatically here. Uh, promoting migration and what migrants bring to society will be a hard sell, as long as large chunk of society don't feel secure about their own future. And <clears throat> economic insecurity is easier to tackle. Let's build a more inclusive economy. Let's create more economic opportunities for all and cultural insecurity will recede dramatically and migrants will be viewed much more positively. This may sound very naive, but uh, it, it is not. Indeed, we, we strongly believe that we have a great lever at hand, which is human capital, the individual employment on the job market and the war in, in the workplace. Let's look at Nordic countries. You know, they have very strong safety nets, cost, uh, costly social models, and thus they have very high production costs and yet they manage to be among the most competitive economies in the world. If you look at the top 12 most competitive e economies in the world, according to the w World Economic Forum, five of them are Nordic. So five of the 12 top um, most uh, competitive economies in the world have, have very high uh, production costs and social models. So there is no trade-off between competitiveness and, 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 and social protection. And so the way for developed economies to address the challenge from emerging economies like China is not to compete on cost, will never be cheaper than them. Uh, it will only drive a race to the bottom in both in terms of salaries and social protection. The solution is to compete on value through educated and skilled workforce. <clears throat> you know, there was a, a, a New York Times survey uh, a, a few months ago, which showed that 80%, uh, no, 70% of US workers um, uh, view um, uh, machines uh, and robots negatively, while 80% of Swedish workers view them positively. These are the same workers, same robots, but completely different views, but whether you are in the US or in Sweden. And the reason why that in Sweden, the state invests in, uh, well, helps uh, workers to get trained, the companies invest in their training, uh, and, and so they know that even if they are, their job is being replaced by robots, they will find another job. So there is nothing revolutionary here, but let's make sure we actually invest in people. Let's invest in early infancy to secure everyone has access to group childcare arrangements. 
because it is at that age that kids develop their capabilities and we can efficiently fight inequalities. Let's uh, harness the power of digital to empower workers, for instance, by developing the use of open badges, which allow easy recognition of people's skills. Uh, let's invest in training, reskilling, upskilling programs, especially for low-skilled workers to help, help them find new opportunities work, working with machines. Uh, let's invent new social protections for the digital age, for instance, for gig workers by uh, securing access to training, social security, securing representation processes and social dialogue. And so to conclude with, I think migrants should definitely be including these efforts, uh, not more, but no less than other workers. And this is the best, this will be in the end, the best way to recognize, to enhance and to promote their contribution for society. Excellent. It's, uh, you know, sometimes we think that when we start things right away, we're trying to, to do the right thing and we start small, uh, but we realize later on the, the impact that we have can be really tremendous. I always say if I can change someone's mind, uh, I know that that person might be able to lead at one particular time. Um, and and mm -hmm. I'll show really a, a story where the, um, the premier of China uh, we have a pro program in the U.S. We invite high school kids to come uh, to the U.S. to understand the U.S. culture. Uh, and he uh, went to Idaho for a year. And when he came to visit, to come, he came to uh, the White House uh, when Obama was there. Uh, he made a point of spending an entire day with his family from Idaho. And and I think uh, one of the things that's interesting is that folks didn't know that that he really was like you know he really did had a different perspective, right? If you're if you are welcoming. Uh, and if you're open, uh, I was just, you know, I was just so happy he wasn't beaten up as a kid <laughs> or bullied. So it's really important that, you know, that, 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 that when you start like, you know, integrating children and you start getting them involved and, and start getting them to, to be part of a society. And, uh, and in my story, it's interesting too, because, uh, you know, my mother's from Honduras, my father's Norwegian American, very different, you know, Scandinavian, Latin, uh, in that perspective. Uh, so I've heard many, many jokes about that, um, but but it's been a great balance. So, um, you know, I'm going to uh, open it up to questions. Uh, I always love to talk as a, in a fireside chat. Uh, but if you uh, have any questions for each other, you know, is there something that, you know, sparked some some uh, ideas or questions? Uh, you know, Alice, Matthias, is there anything that from each other? Please just uh, jump in. I think that uh, one of the key things here is, is to have an open dialogue. Um, and uh, my first question is, what inspired you to really look at, at, uh, at radical exchange and some of our models? Um, I, you talked about a trust, right? We really, our, our models really are based on how do we figure out that trust in, in, in the community and how do we validate that? Um, how do we actually make a, a significant contribution by the citizen? And the citizen is always first and right at the center. Um, is there anything in particular that jumps at you that you, you're like, wow, we, we think we can apply that uh, to what we're working on and what we're doing? I do have an answer to that and also very connected to the answer I wanted to give to Matthias. Um, <laughs> good. So because Matthias, you mentioned that we need to invest a lot in trainings, especially like to end uh, the, the us versus them narrative. But um, it, it, it rang a bell because uh, I was last week, uh, it was my birthday and I turned 23, uh, 33, oh. sorry. I wish it was 23. <laughs> uh, and you look I, like you're 23. Right. <laughs> and um, so two friends of mine who, who are, are from Syria and, and moved to France um, four years ago and because they have a refugee background also. They, they took me on a holiday in Brittany, in the Trotta, a very beautiful spot. And we were in the car and I, I was sharing with them uh, my personal, I have a personal project that I really care for. And, and I told them, look, I, I really want to build a, an incubator for leadership, um, especially in politics, for people who are refugees and migrants, because we're lacking, there is a huge lack of political leadership um, from refugees and, and, and migrants, newcomers. And, and I, I was sharing that with them and I was super enthusiastic about that. And because I'm, you know, all the scenes and even today, uh, I'm not like, I'm not that entitled to talk on the behalf of refugees. There's a lack of people who are refugees being on stage and being promoted and highlighted as leaders. 
And my niece, my, my friend, she was tell, she answered to me, like, look, Alice, um, everything you achieved so far, I know it was really hard for you, but think about me. How, how hard can it be? Like, if you want people like me to become political leaders, that will be 10 times harder than for you. And because I lost 10 years of my life and the journey, because I, and now I had to restart everything from scratch and I'm turning 30, and she's turning 37. And she was like, I, I, I'm 10 years late. So the, the reflection I had about investing on trainings and all, it's also about how to highlight untapped, pot untapped potential from the very beginning. Because now we see also that people are, that are refugees and migrants are thinking out of the box. I saw extraordinary innovation uh, in tech, in civic empowerment. I'm thinking about um, Carbon Mobile in Germany, who's a, which is a, a mobile device uh, created by Firas, who is Syrian. And because he, he went through the, the migration journey and escaped Syria to Germany, he realized that his phone uh, was not resisting temperatures, and the battery was really shitty. Uh, so he thought, I need to create a new phone that would resist to everything and never die. So he took the carbon technology, like the technology from space, to create a, a mobile phone. And it's rocking right now, and it's super, it's really working well in Germany. It's called Carbon Mobile. And also, uh, one of the speakers from uh, the conference, uh, my, my Monato, she's she co-founded Gribouilly, and uh, it's um, well, she doesn't have a refugee background, but her mother has a, a, a migrant background, and because they saw a huge lack, and because also it's not something they shared with me, but I would assume because also a lot of people who are nannies, uh, as you mentioned, Natalia, are uh, people from a migrant background, are immigrants, and the, the color of the skin uh, would also kind of sometimes um, determine um, some kind of job because the, the people would tell them, oh, you're an African immigrant, so maybe, especially in France, uh, you, you can become nanny. And Gribouilly is really good because it's, it, in France, it's, um, it's empowering women to take leadership on the job that is some, most of the time deconsidered by, um, by, by people at an individual level. So I guess my reflection today is about how to empower leaders how to make people feel that yes, they can do it. And also by taking into account uh, all the obstacles they had to face because there was many, there were many, many obstacles. And there are still today, we're talking a lot about holy um, systemic racism. And these are things to be taken into account. And because I'm French, I know in France, it's not like American mentality, um, ethnical statistics are illegal. So taking into account systemic racism is quite hard right now for in, in my country. But I assume that, and to answer, and to, 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 to conclude on that, like the, this conference right now is highlighting people from very diverse background, very diverse DNA, very diverse competences. And it's not, a, in French we say entre soi, like we, we stay among peers, like we're all like, um, uh, some kind of activist entrepreneurs and with a lot of old words and all. And I, I, I love the fact that here, right here, right now, it's not about like, oh, I'm going to promote myself or I'm, go I'm going to promote my work. It's really peer to peer. And without this, um, you know, high level conferences, snobism of, of posh mindset, I would say. So for that, I really love the fact that I'm here today with you. Oh, wonderful. Any thoughts, Matthias? Um, well, um, first of all, I want to say that investing in, in, in training might sound a very obvious and, uh, and common idea. But in, w when you look, for instance, at what governments did in the, in, in the last weeks, you know, they, mm. they put billions, even trillions of dollars and euros into the economy. Uh, as relief packages um, uh, to, you know, to address the, the pandemic crisis. And uh, almost none of this uh, money went to training. Zero. Everything was spent, I mean, you have trillions of dollars which have spent on helping the economy and zero on training. So it's not uh it, it's not that common an idea in in, in uh, investing in training is the, the 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 skills of tomorrow and the employability of tomorrow and, and and so let's fight for this um 
But um, more broadly, I want to give a, an illustration of how uh, our model helps um, uh, promoting um, migrants. As I said, we have a think tank and an action lab, and the action lab is helping uh, is helping uh, grassroots uh, organizations um, um, by um, we provide pro bono advice to help them grow. Uh, we take uh, we take lawyers, we take we take consultants, uh, any kind of um, experienced um, you know um, professionals, and and provide um, free advice. I have two uh, two examples in mind. The first is Tot, which is a, a, an organization which was um, created in France in the in the wake of the uh, of the migrant uh, crisis. A few years ago, and they help. Um, they provide French teaching. Uh, they, they teach French to migrants to accelerate their integration into, into society, and they do it so well. Then they, they, they do it much much better than uh, uh, than public courses or, or whatever. And, and so they are providing great. They are doing a great job, and we help them uh, grow grow faster. Another um, another organization we have is Wintergrade. Which helps uh, migrants find their way into the into the, the, the job market. As you said, uh, Alice, it is much much harder for migrants to uh, work their way into society, and so they need to navigate uh, all, all the uh, uh, the administrative curriculum, etc. And, and so Wintergrade does that, and, and and it is a way to leverage what they have to bring. Usually, they have uh, outstanding skills, um, and we are happy to to help them do that. And so. This is a model which can be replicated anywhere. You you bring a grassroots organization on the one hand, which often have great ideas, uh, great initiatives, but they lack uh, you know uh, business skills or or management skills to to grow as fast as they could. And on the other hand, you take uh, really skilled uh, professionals, which give uh, one or two hours a, a week or a month uh, of their time to help this to help this organization grow. And I think that, you know, providing those ladders, we called it ladders of opportunity, um, is how we, you know, people who are established when, when we started looking at how do we get more women uh, to start businesses, right? How do we get folks to, to really uh, step up? Uh, we actually, you know, some, some corporations were very keen on let, let's go ahead and do some more mentoring. Uh, let's go ahead and figure out how to elevate you. Um, and, you know, I, I always, in my, in my speeches, I always have to highlight the amount of companies. Uh, you know, I, I live in Silicon Valley. Uh, look at, 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 at Yahoo, started by a Taiwanese immigrant. Look at Google, started by Sergey Brim, who's from Russia. Uh, look at eBay, uh, started by Pierre Omidyar, who's a big supporter of ours uh, from France. Uh, I mean, there's so many folks who came to the U.S. with nothing. This it was practically nothing, and, and they made the best of it. And I always tell people, look, uh, I don't see a lot of immigrants begging on the street. I see them uh, working two, three jobs because they're trying to make some money and be able to build themselves, but also send money back to those countries where they come from. Um, you know, so it's 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 tremendous. Uh, for I was born in Honduras, and um, and you know what would be the the uh, largest uh, economic uh, income for the country is the remesas, the, the money that is received by people outside uh, who are sending money back. It's not coffee, it's not bananas, uh, it's that. And, and so we're, we're looking at how to empower that. that that's really important. Um, let me check if there's some more questions from the audience. Uh, I have a ton of questions, of course. But okay. um, you know, <laughs> you know, uh, yeah. um, I, I want to to give another illustration because you, 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 we didn't talk that much about innovation. Yeah. Um, yes. uh, there was an uh, I like the surveys from the New York Times. There was an uh, uh, another survey which I found in New York Times about uh, um, where do people who innovate come from and. Uh, that was, of course, specific to the U.S. and figures would be different in Europe. But there was a striking insight that um, it's not the level of um, uh, scientific skills which matter. You can take uh, kids uh, from uh, with the same level of, of scientific skills, and uh, the ability to actually innovate differs dramatically. Uh, 
whether they uh, depending on their social background uh, uh, and so people with a, 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 a disadvantaged social background will not innovate or will much less innovate than people uh, from uh, advantage uh, social background and, and the reason is that they don't dare uh, they don't have uh, they don't have enough exposure to the uh, in, in innovation um, ecosystem and so um, offering more exposure uh, to uh, a larger set of kids to scientific culture to uh, scientific uh, to uh, innovation spaces is a great way to um, expand the um, expand um, the, um, the talent pool from which uh, a, a country will innovate. And so this is one of the things we are fighting for uh, at uh, Le Plus Important, to uh, uh, spread the uh, culture, uh, offer more opportunities or more exposure to scientific uh, and uh, industrial culture to, to everyone in France and to leverage uh, researchers because researchers are keen on sharing uh, the experience. And so we, we, we take them and we bring them to um, to middle school uh, classes, to high school classes, to, to share the experience and to um, tell kids, yes, you can do it. <laughs> well, we like that. We like that uh, phrase. Yes, we can. Um, <laughs> it, you know, uh, my former president was a son of an uh, immigrant in some way or another, yes, um, yes. and uh, with a funny name, and you know, he was able to accomplish a lot. So. Uh, and, you know, uh, some of the questions uh, from the audience um, are some countries, right, or some regions or, or maybe some states, because everything's local, um, if they don't have the initiatives, uh, if, if the developed countries in many ways already kind of have some kind of infrastructure for training, for example, already started, for some of the uh, countries that don't have any of this yet in place, what, what are some of the um, suggestions or, or advice, or what type of policy uh, should we should they start uh, looking at? I mean, I, I replicating. Uh, I would think this is what's great. We can replicate your model, and what you've done in France, and you know take that to other places. And I know that, that you have been in other countries trying to build that. Um, so, in more what are some? Hmm. Yes. <laughs> so, from a local, you know, when when I talk about mentoring, uh, a lot of, we have a good mentoring program in the U.S., but no one really knows so much about it uh, uh, until we actually have to spread the word. So, what is it that you know some of these uh, regions could do? Well, or, I think one of the great things about mentoring. Sorry, uh, Alice. Um, go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, please go. Yeah, one of the great things about mentoring programs is that they are very easy to, to set up, uh, you know, just with, with, a, with a WhatsApp account, you can help uh, um, match between uh, supply and demand uh, of mentoring and, and the, the density of the grassroots organizations might differ from one country to another, but they are always always uh, organizations which uh, which help uh, uh, kids succeed at school or, or youth enter the job market or or uh, provide language training uh, to to migrants they are always uh, initiatives and and you don't have to have uh, to have 20 of them just start with one you know one one person helping one one organization and then another one in just one by one it will make a difference in the end um, <clears throat> and concrete solutions um, about how to engage more people in mobilizing I, I, so very concretely with singa we, we we work and operate as a franchise model and a franchise system so whoever wants to create a single chapter in its city um, or country uh, can apply to do so and we support with the whole uh, onboarding training and, and and brand license and then this is how we scale this is how people are now 
uh, quitting, and this is extraordinary to say to, to see that quitting their jobs, uh, quitting their also sometimes their lives to launch a single uh, a single chapter in their country. What's amazing right now is that most of the applications that we receive to launch a singa comes from people who are migrants and newcomers we we launched uh, recently a singa in the bay area uh, launched by um, a, a woman from honduras we are uh, we're rebooting our london chapter and it's launched by three amazing uh, civic leaders from syria who 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 requested asylum in, in the UK. So what I what that made also that made me think about the extraordinary power of civic mobilization and the fact that anyone anywhere can actually act locally. And we saw that during the pandemic. Like everybody would agree that implementing policies was a very, very top-down approach to solve concrete local issues. And um, all, all the things that happened during the COVID crisis, especially in France, was that what work, what was working was in, were initiatives that were low tech and super local and all governments I think uh, uh, in the world would agree on that and um, they all agreed also to say okay it's time also to end the solutionism of saying oh this is what we need to do no it's about doing with people and not for them it's about considering people and taking them as stakeholders of the solutions that's being provided so that would be my first advice but Taking a step back on the, on the mentoring and concrete solution conversation, I also, I also think that right now we, we're, we're seeing an entire generation who doesn't know what a border is, especially um, in Europe, North America. Um, we see young people who are facing tremendous challenges that have no nationality, pandemics, global warming, uh, inequality, um, you name it, like we know that there's going to be next crisis that will be waiting for us and the enemy is always invisible, artificial intelligence, big data. And we also see that people are, that young people now have not been raised with borders. They have internet, they can study abroad. Uh, you don't have to be Russian or Syrian to play Pokemon Go or date someone on Tinder. So it's also easier for the young generation to, to feel that, okay, there's something global going on and I need to, to step in and need to speak up because what I'm going to say is going to play a major role in, in, in global crisis that we're going to face. And migration will be not a crisis, but a consequence also of all that. If you're thinking of it, the pandemic, the COVID-19 has had a huge influence on migration. Uh, you could see in India, uh, millions of migrants were forced to go back to their home villages in rural areas. But you also see that in countries like France or the US, the richest people had the chance to move away in their second home near the sea to spend the lockdown away from big cities. So migration has never been so intense than in the past three months. So when you think about it, I, the world is shifting. Human beings are born with legs and, and feet. So it's our DNA to walk and, 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 and move uh, across the planet. So I believe that, that there's going to be a future of the world that, because you mentioned uh, nation states and borders, there will be a future on this planet. And I'm super optimistic on that, where like the move, people will become human of movement and movement will also shape what we're going to do with humankind and the progress of humanity. Perfectly said. And, you know, as an urban planner, um, uh, we, the, our mind in, in many ways is regional, right? There, there shouldn't be really uh, borders. And, and when I w was working in, in a, uh, Poland, Czech Republic, and Hungary uh, and during NATO accession and then EU accession, after that, you know, I came back to Pennsylvania. And, and I couldn't believe that between Pennsylvania and New Jersey, they couldn't agree on like collecting data on water. And I was just like stunned, like, how are we going to compete? How are we going to collaborate? How are we going to, you know, think for the future? This was 20, 20 years ago. And, and we're still having that discussion sometimes. And, but you're right. I, I have so much faith in our younger generation. <laughs> um, and, and on that note, uh, there was a question from the audience. Um, where do we start as political leaders, right? Uh, and his question is like, where can I apply? Uh, well, tough to say where you apply. But one of the things that, that I know that you're part, you were part of, uh, and, and a lot of our uh, younger legislators are very open to have a dialogue uh, with younger folks to, to get involved politically, to get involved in, from the civic tech society, 
to get involved with open uh, organizations. Um, and, you know, in our Congress, uh, it's been amazing. All these young women and all women of color, uh, women from different religious backgrounds, people that were not the, the type, you know, the type that, of person who run. So, uh, and, and people were very uh, annoyed in some way. They were like, whoa, I can't believe that we have Muslims on Congress. And it's just so ridiculous because that's not the case, right? That's, we're so fortunate to have a diversity of thought. Uh, and so they're role models. They are the role models, I think, in many ways. Like you both said, we need role models, all right? We really need to, to bring those up and, and elevate them. So um, any other, you know, I, I know that we could talk about this subject for a long time, but one of the things, too, is uh, you mentioned, uh, Alice, um, during the pandemic, right, this really proved that we needed our agriculture workers. Uh, we weren't letting them across the border, and our farming industry was just, you know, devastated in many ways. And and then people were ordering, you know, from supermarkets, and then we had an empty shelves. So it's a, it's a domino effect that policymakers are not really thinking about. How do we think about that for the future? You know, when we talk about resiliency, right? Well, what was incredible with Singa was to see that hundreds of newcomers, like refugees, immigrants, uh, have reached out to share with their resilience stories, and they said, you know, I escaped war, I can survive a lockdown, but mm -hmm. also. <laughs> Like, and also lots of them have also shared with us their resilient stories by saying, I grew up in a country where local economy or circular economy was kind of shaped by invisible borders such as um, cartel drugs, thinking about Colombia, yeah. for instance, or flooding, thinking about Sudan, for instance. And they were like, I have this project and I think it can work here. I want to adapt. So we that made us think about how to create a kind of resilience academy um, to enable people from all these diverse backgrounds to bring their resilience and their solutions to create the future that we want. And again, I'm optimistic when it comes to political leadership and not necessarily on entrepreneurship, but it's really about shaping the future we want. Um, when I had the chance to work with President Obama, he, he, he told me, look, you can, you can be a political leader, run the world, be at, sit at the White House, and next day, you don't know what's happening, but there's someone else coming and it's destroying all the work that you've been doing. Not mentioning his stories, but yeah. <laughs> um, that's really resonated with me. And he said, so right now, I guess the, the ultimate objective, the, the ultimate objective is, may not be uh, to get a seat at the table, but um, it should be also to inspire and empower young people. Um, you, you, and, you know, yeah. thank you, you thanks, you, and you, Matthias. Yes, um, you say uh, people in the audience ask where where to start. Um, I would say there are plenty of opportunities uh, to engage. Uh, I, I would say don't rush, and the why matters more than the what. Uh, you do choose a cause that you will stand for in the long term. Uh, and, and, and then this will be more meaningful and more effective if uh, this um, really string, uh, 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 rings a bell or, or <clears throat> um, um, is related to a strong belief you have and choose a cause. And then you can move from one organization to another as long as there is continuity in your engagement and, and meaning. And, and that, that matters more than the actual name or, or, or of the organization you, 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 you support. Because, Very good point. It's about also, the passion. Because uh, having impact takes time. Uh, yes. <laughs> being an entrepreneur is a, uh, it, 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 is a matter of a lot of time and energy and 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 and, and consistency and uh, resilience are are really key to having impact uh, and so that's why you, your engagement your involvement needs to be based on strong beliefs and so what what uh, uh, where does your heart beat and go where where it is most meaningful for you and then the rest will follow very very wise uh, words thank you so much it's, it's it's what you're passionate about if you 
you know, if you're not yes. passionate, then you won't you won't yes. be happy uh, every day, and and it, and it and it shows, right? When we're passionate about things, we really make a make it into something that we do twenty four seven, and that's one of the things that um, we're very passionate that radical has changed, and and I'm just so thrilled for the people that I work with uh, because they, it's twenty four seven for us, and uh, we make a point of making this not only growing within our country and uh, within our respective countries, but uh, but across the world, right? And and that's how we start a movement. And um, and one of the key, I think, messages for young people as we close this today um, is, you know, go out there, do what you do best, uh, do it with passion, uh, do it with compassion, uh, with yes, respect, yes. and making sure that, that we do this, right? Yes. Any last and, uh, and, and 20 seconds? Yes, one, la uh, one last word, uh, and then I, I uh, hand it out to, to Alice for conclusion. But... I remember once I heard uh, Tom Friedman, you know, the, uh, the editorialist for the New York Times again. Uh, um, he said, don't expect people to do the right thing for the right reason. Doing the right thing is enough. Uh, <laughs> and don't expect, uh, don't ask people to do the right thing for the right reason. Focus on the right thing and, 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 and go for it. And thank you so much. I was really thrilled to have this opportunity to share this time with you and and and, and long live a ready goal exchange. Thank you, Alice. Well, for the last word uh, to the young to, to to the young generation that is going to step step in, take control. Uh, I'm very cheerful, and 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 I want to say it's time to speak up. I know it's hard, but. It's essential, but I also want to address people who already have a seat at the table and, and tell them, like, you need to step away. You also need to leave your seat and think about the youngest voice and put them at the center. Uh, it's not time to get separated from each other and build walls uh, be, uh, between generations, but to bridge and bond among people, especially at civic leaders. Perfect. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day. Bye.